You know, our last video on this topic had the Flat Earthers fuming. I'm Aiden Mattis, and welcome back to the Lore Lounge. The first video in our series on the Flat Earth ended with a pretty simple question. How is it that, in the face of overwhelming scientific evidence and abundant scriptural context, people in the year of our Lord 2024 still believe that the Earth is flat? The first step in understanding this worldview was to go back and look at where it began. When did the Earth go from being a flat disk to a sphere? And when did it go from being a sphere in the middle of the universe to a sphere slightly off-center from the middle of the universe? And from there, how did it go from being a sphere slightly off-center in the middle of the universe to a sphere that orbits the Sun, which is in the middle of the universe? And you can see where this goes. It was a long process. There is something of a general misconception that up until Copernicus, everybody believed the Earth was a flat disk, and that's simply not true. There were approximately 1700 years of new scientific hypotheses and testing and argumentation that all led to the current heliocentric model of the solar system. You see, by around the year 1820, there were very few educated people in the world who were questioning the idea that the Earth was a spheroid that orbits around a sun that is itself moving through open space. Churches had been teaching that the Earth was a globe since the dawn of Christianity, and most people in the West were Christian, so most people in the West were learning that the Earth was a globe. It wasn't an entirely massive step for them to go from the Earth is a globe to the Earth is a globe that is not at the center of the universe. But somehow, about three decades after the last Western institutions to question this theory fell, something weird happened. A guy by the name of Samuel Rowbottom started doing a series of experiments over in England, and he was arguing that his experiments proved the Earth was in fact not just not orbiting the Sun, but also not a sphere at all. It was a, a flat plane of some kind. And yes, in the previous video, I did call him Rowbottom, and I realized that that was the wrong pronunciation, and I decided to change it because Rowbottom's funnier. Now, the thing about Rowbottom is that his experiments and his early publications around the year 1850 didn't really convince many people. They weren't very well circulated, very few people saw them, but those that did took them pretty seriously, because to the untrained eye, Rowbottom was making really good arguments. And at the time, the broader scientific community wasn't all that aware of the burgeoning Flat Earth movement. So, when Robottom came forward with his experiments, they were generally either laughed out of academia, or they just were ignored. But, Robottom did manage to get himself a few supporters, and some rather wealthy ones in the Lady Elizabeth Blunt and a man by the name of John Hamden. John Hamden put out an open call for somebody to repeat Robottom's experiments, and in the earlier video, we did only go over one. There were several, but they were all kind of along the same line. Uh, they were all along the Bedford level, which is a canal in England. But anyway, John Hamden said, all right, you know what? Somebody come forward, somebody else do this. A scientist, a surveyor, somebody skilled in the field. Repeat it so that we can prove the Earth is flat. A man by the name of Alfred Russell Wallace actually took up the challenge, not even really all that aware of Robottom's previous work, and he set up his own experiment, which, of course, at the end of the day, proved the Earth has curvature to it, and if you want more details on that, it's in the first video. Wallace's refutation, however, was not really enough for the Flat Earth community, who continued to grow, and in 1893, Lady Elizabeth Blunt, who previously had just been kind of on the fringes and, and reading things, and I believe in 1888 she got involved directly, but around the year 1893, she formed her own thing, the Universal Zetetic Society. And while this society had existed informally for several years beforehand, this was its formal genesis. This is where it came to be a, a foundation. And they had a small list of readers. They would send out a periodical that had opinion pieces, and in some cases, people claiming to have proved the Earth was flat. But it didn't really get a ton of traction outside of the very small... And again, we're talking a few hundred people here. This is not, you know, you're hopping on Twitter and every third person is arguing the Earth is flat. This is, you are probably not going to meet a flat Earther ever in your life if you're living in the 1800s. You may meet somebody who never learned the Earth is a globe, but that's a little different from being a flat Earther. 
The movement only really started to pick up steam after a guy named Samuel Shenton got involved. Shenton began to question the shape of the Earth in the 1920s, and then in the year 1956, he founded the International Flat Earth Research Society, which, as I said in the previous video, was very unfortunate timing because in 1957 the Russians put Sputnik into space. Shenton's iteration of the society claimed the same general things that Robottom had. The Earth is a flat disk, it is a plane of some size. Of course, there wasn't a ton of agreement on what the exact form was. Was it a, a square with a circle in the middle? Was it an endless expanse of ice in all directions? Was there something beyond the Antarctic ice wall? Nobody really knew for sure, but they agreed on the same general things. There's a solid dome over top of it, the sun, the moon, they're local, they're rotating above us. Basically, every single thing Robottom said was disproved by the space race, but Flat Earthers had an interesting argument for that. Space race wasn't real. It was all propaganda. It was, uh, you know, NASA and NATO versus whatever the Russian space agency was called in the USSR. I remember one person complained in the comments of the last video that I referred to it as NATO versus the USSR and said that NASA was under the NATO umbrella, and of course, technically NASA is not directly under the NATO umbrella, but NATO, United States, NASA, NASA's under the NATO umbrella. Like, if we want to get super duper technical with it, no, nobody who is in command of NATO has direct control over NASA, but NATO's main member state has direct control over NASA. Y you get my point. I also didn't even really bring up the fact that there's also a Chinese space agency, an Indian space agency, a British space agency, a French space agency, uh, a Russian space agency, of course. There's a lot of space agencies out there, so it's not just NASA that's out there, you know, taking pictures from space. But again, we, we already went over that in the previous video. This video is not going to be about the space race. It's not going to be about if NASA's being honest or not. What we're covering here are the very simple arguments, the, the, the visual things, the, the observations that flat earthers tend to use. Because at their core, most flat earther arguments are not based upon scientific laws of physics, because they can't be. If they are, they have to acknowledge certain other laws upon which those laws are founded. This is why you'll pretty much only ever see Flat Earthers denying the figures given by NASA rather than putting forward their own. Samuel Shenton led the International Flat Earth Research Society until his death in 1972, but the community, the organization, did not die with him. Instead, it was taken over by a man by the name of Charles K. Johnson. While Shenton was an Englishman native to Dover, United Kingdom, Charles K. Johnson was a resident of Lancaster, California, which I would expect they pronounce Lancaster, they are wrong. The Amish are right there and I will ask them for you. And while I'm asking the Amish, I'm also gonna ask them if they believe the Earth is round because their, their stuff hasn't changed since like the 1700s. Speaking of which, now is a very good time to subscribe to our Patreon because we're bringing back drunk folklore and also we're trying to get into a studio space that was built in the 1700s. And by the way, for anybody who's like new to the channel because we're covering Flat Earth and you came here because you're angry at us, we don't usually pitch the Patreon this early in the video. It's usually at the very end. We just, the 1700s thing, we went and checked out a property this morning. It felt relevant and it's expensive. But anyway, as I was saying, Charles K. Johnson of Lancaster, California took over for Samuel Shenton of England right around 1972. And while you might expect that the passing of, who was essentially the founder of this movement, would kill the movement, it didn't. In fact, Johnson not only prevented the total collapse of the International Flat Earth Research Society, but he pretty substantially increased its membership. At the time of Shenton's demise, it's believed there were only about a hundred people in the movement. By the time that, uh, that Charles K. Johnson really got things going in the 90s, there were about 3,000. Still not a huge number of people, but rather impressive growth. But what was really interesting about Johnson was that whereas Shenton had started the organization at a time before space travel, Johnson was in its golden age. We were getting into the space shuttle era. In fact, if you look at the entirety of Johnson's tenure, it covers the end of the Apollo missions all the way through the construction of the ISS. And this meant that throughout his career, he had to answer a lot of questions about what NASA was saying. And of course, we'll get into how he was just kind of dismissive of all of it, but you know, I want to go sort of periodically first. Because the, the important thing about Johnson is not necessarily that he traverses the space age, but that he gets into the internet era. And flat eartherism in the 21st century, in the age of the internet, is going to be the main chunk of this video. But first, let's go through how we get from Charles K. Johnson's International Flat Earth Research Society 
to the Flat Earth Society of 2004. How does the Flat Earth model change? How does the community adapt to the various different arguments made by people trying to prove to them that the Earth is round? Due to the small scale of the Flat Earth movement, not a ton of their early work has survived. So what I did was I went back and I found newspaper articles from the 70s up through the early 2000s. And I looked at when people asked Charles Johnson, what do you believe? What did he say? Did it evolve over the years? Did anything, uh, you know, fade completely out of existence? Or did he become stronger in certain opinions? Well, on November 10th, 1975, the San Francisco Chronicle published an article by Stan Delaplane in which he wrote about Johnson and this strange society of his. According to Delaplane, an English wire service, think the Associated Press, but in England, released a message around this time. It was unclear exactly when it went out, but it read, After seeing photographs taken from space vehicles, the Flat Earth Society today disbanded. It seems Delaplane reported on this, and the uh, this this article, this editorial really, was his response to receiving a letter from Charles Johnson in regard to that article. Apparently, the allegation that the Flat Earth Society had disbanded absolutely incensed Johnson, who wrote a letter in which he said, your claim that the Flat Earth Society was disbanded is entirely false. Obviously, that part doesn't sound too incensed. We're getting there. I also will say I tried to track down the original date of that wire service message and the article that would have been published by Della Plain, but I can't find it. Uh, it may have been an English tabloid. In fact, it seems very likely that it was an English tabloid based on the way that Della Plain talks about it. But Delaplane further quoted Johnson as saying, I can't understand where you got such an idea. The longer the idiotic, childish farce called the space program goes on, the more people will have to wake up to the fact it's all just Buck Rogers fake movies. Buck Rogers was an early American sci-fi character created by uh, Philip Francis Newman back in 1929. It was primarily a comic strip, but there were TV series in the early 50s, and again, I want to say in the 70s. It was also one of the primary influences for George Lucas when he was writing Star Wars. Johnson went on to say, We fully expect the U.S. government, by or before 1984, to admit that the Earth is flat. This was followed by Johnson stating, This is the darkest period ever recorded in history. So-called science is based upon superstition. Please correct yourself. We are alive and well. That is the good news, O ye of little faith. I'm sure I don't need to point out the irony of the sentence, so-called science is based upon superstition in these circumstances, but I also kind of had to laugh. Towards the end of the article, Delaplane also gave Johnson a little bit of a boost by saying, by the way, he's going to be having a Flat Earth conference in Boston in 1976. But if a Flat Earth conference did occur in Boston in 1976, there are no reports of it, nor are there any reports of the government, uh, you know, saying the Earth is flat by or before 1984 nor did they admit it's flat after the Challenger exploded. And I feel like if we lost astronauts that horrifically, it might be time to put the kibosh on it, you know? Like, I feel like somebody at NASA would have said something. Also, if nobody said anything after the Challenger and nobody said anything after the Columbia, that's two space shuttles that exploded. Somebody in their families would have said something. You would think. A little over a decade later, in 1987, journalist Jack Smith spoke to Charles Johnson for an article in, let me see if I can find it, ah, it was in the LA Times, after a reader described the Flat Earth Movement's pitch as follows. The assertion that the Earth is round is only a theory never proven, and that scientists have banded together in a Machiavellian conspiracy or plot to mislead a naive public into believing that we are living on a sphere, whereas it's obvious, they say, that the world is flat. So, Smith called Johnson for an interview. Are you kidding, the journalist asked, or do you really believe the Earth is flat? Johnson responded, the whole idea of the Earth being a spinning ball is just ridiculous. We have studied the Earth and found it flat. Smith then pivoted, asking, If it's flat, why don't we fall off the edge? Johnson answered, There is no edge, and as far as we know, it's endless. And this is important, because there's th that's not consistent. Not everybody today argues for an endless Earth. There are a lot of people that say it ends at the ice wall, and the ice wall is where the dome is. Then there are others who say, yeah, it's flat, but it's not an endless plane of ice. There's other continents beyond it. That's, you know, like, that's, that's, I, I just want to, I do have to give credit where it's due. That seems to be an extraordinarily minority opinion in the Flat Earth movement, that there are continents beyond the ice wall, that that's where Atlantis and Hyperborea and all of that are. That does seem to be just kind of the, 
the nutty side of things. That said, dude, if you, you write a fantasy novel, whether you believe the Earth is flat or not, the idea that our current world is encircled by an ice wall that has other continents beyond it is is a pretty cool idea for like a, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s fantasy sci-fi story. Jules Verne did it with Hollow Earth. I'm sure somebody could do it with Flat Earth. But in any case, Johnson said that it's endless. We don't know where the where the end of the plane is. And Smith, being an educated man, pivoted once again to ask another question that he felt, you know, he was basically seeing Johnson's responses and going, all right, this isn't going to go anywhere. Let's see what else. And what he did was ask about the Greeks. As we covered in the first video in the series, the Greeks were pretty sure the Earth was a sphere very early. In response to this, Johnson implied that Pythagoras, Plato, Aristotle, Aristarchus, Archimedes, Eratosthenes, Cleomedes, Ptolemy, and numerous other ancient Greek mathematicians were, uh, a bunch of old men sitting around on marble steps spinning fantasies. He added that it was the same with modern scientists, only they sit around chewing cigars and drinking whiskey and thinking up absurd theories. Smith pushed Johnson, asking about the Apollo missions and the pictures that the crews of those missions took. Absurd, answered Johnson. There was no moon landing. To be clear, he did not elaborate. He, he did not give an explanation for why there was no moon landing. He just said it didn't happen, which, as we're all aware, is not an argument. As for why anybody would lie about such a thing, Johnson answered with a different question than what you see from a lot of modern flat earthers. And he said that it, was, that it all started when Khrushchev came up with a story about Sputnik, which meant that Kennedy had to respond. In the end, he said, the whole thing was cooked up to produce more jobs. And I actually love this interview because it just perfectly encapsulates the way that flat earthers tend to argue. His very first response, the whole idea of the earth being a spinning ball is just ridiculous. We have studied the earth and found it flat, is an argument from incredulity. He says we studied it and found it flat, but he provides no evidence of such. And he turns around and calls the actual, you know, studied theory that the earth is a globe ridiculous. That's not an argument. It is an argument from incredulity. Something can't be true because I can't comprehend it. His second claim is made entirely without evidence. He simply says that the world is endless without providing a single shred of evidence or reasoning. When asked about the Greeks, he's just dismissive, describing them as a bunch of old men sitting around on marble steps and spinning fantasies. But as was shown earlier in this series, those individuals used math and logic to come to their conclusions. And so far as I can tell, Johnson never actually tried to refute them. I went and looked for an actual argument from Johnson refuting Eratosthenes or Aristotle, and there isn't one. It may not exist anymore, it may simply be lost, but so far as I could tell, there wasn't an argument. And he said the same of modern scientists, even as he watched them build rockets and launch them into space in real time. And that makes this claim just a simple denial of reality, because even if you say that the rockets aren't making it to space, those scientists clearly aren't just sitting around chewing cigars and sipping whiskey. They're building rockets. Also, it just occurred to me as we were recording the video, but the idea that Kennedy cooked this up to produce more jobs is... Very strange, because the late 50s and early 60s were economically a fantastic time to be an American. To, to be a, a Russian, not so much. His response to the moon landing is even better if you look at the explanation he gives in the newsletters that have survived. According to him, the moon landing was shot either in a studio or in a crater in Arizona, and it was based on a script written by science fiction author Arthur C. Clarke. If the name Arthur C. Clarke seems familiar, he was the author of 2001 A Space Odyssey, and he also worked on the film script with Stanley Kubrick, and that film came out in 1968. It's actually a frighteningly prescient film in the age of AI. Also, trippy as hell. His newsletters also contain some very important nuggets, such as the facts that sunrise and sunset were optical illusions, and that eclipses were explained by the Bible, which tells us that the heavens are a mystery, even though the Bible says no such thing. The Bible says heaven is indescribable, it says that uh, it's, it's, it, it can't be put into human words, but it does not say the heavens are a mystery. I looked, like I, I went and I looked in multiple translations for a place where it says the heavens are a mystery, and the only thing I can find is stuff that is in direct relation to the heaven, the, the realm we go to after we die if we're good. That's not meant to be taken as literal religious commentary. I'm just trying to do the differentiation in simple terms without getting into the nitty-gritty of the theology. Sadly, eight years later, tragedy struck the then 3,500-member strong Flat Earth Society when the home of Charles K. Johnson burned to the ground and took all of the records with it. 
Now, that 3,500 member number comes from Johnson himself, and he claimed that he had 3,500 people all over the world who were paying him $25 a month to be members of the, flat, the International Flat Earth Research Society, and that in return for their $25 a month, they would receive a publication, a periodical. While that does sound like a very early form of grifting, in my opinion, Johnson was just insane. The day before that fire was reported, however, on September 28th, 1995, Minneapolis Star Tribune writer Jim Klobuchar, who is in fact the father of current United States Senator Amy Klobuchar, penned an article that included an interview with Johnson. The article itself was actually about an incident wherein an NFL referee made a very bad call in a game between the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Minnesota Vikings. The penalty that was called was for an illegal 12th man on the Pittsburgh Steelers side. In NFL football, you can only have 11 people per team on the field at once. And the problem was, the Steelers coaches were very positive of one thing. There were only 11 men on their side of the field. And since the first play that the penalty was called on resulted in a failed field goal attempt by the Vikings, this improperly called penalty gave the Vikings another chance at getting three points, and from a closer location. This made a lot of people very unhappy, regardless of which team they were a fan of, because the NFL was basically, via bad refereeing, rigging a game, which, I mean, never happens now. <laughs> in any case, after this play resulted in the Vikings getting three points they wouldn't have gotten otherwise, the Steelers coaches were furious, and they were demanding that the NFL review the film and come to a conclusion on how many people were on the field. But every referee there that day consistently said there were 12. Even the announcers up in the box said there were 12. However, the actual picture of the field from the play showed very clearly there were only 11 men on the Steelers' side. And this reminded Jim Klobuchar of something that he had come across before. People who, despite pictures showing they're wrong, insist that the, the reality is something else. So Jim Klobuchar contacted Charles Johnson and asked him for an interview. Science is a superstition. It all started with the old Greeks. They were liars, fabulous liars. They started this business about the Earth being a globe absolutely nuts. Those ideas are pumped into everybody when they have pea brain as a children. By the time they're adults, they're hopelessly gullible. If the world was actually a globe, people on the other side of it would be hanging upside down. Call Australia sometime and ask them how's it hanging. Just for clarity, that was not meant to be any sort of political commentary on Donald Trump either direction. I just thought that that sounded very similar to how he talks. If you'd like me to do it in a Bernie Sanders voice, I can too. Science is a superstition. You know, I'm, I'm happy to hit both sides. I am once again asking for proof that the Earth is a globe. But anyway, after getting that quote out of him, Klobuchar asked him about the penalty and explained the situation. And Johnson replied that it was quite possible that, despite every single camera showing 11 men on the field, the referee was still right and all of the cameras somehow missed the 12th man. Klobuchar ended the article soon after, his final line reading, Give this man a whistle and a yellow flag. And I gotta agree? NFL referees have about as much evidence for most of their calls as Flat Earthers do for their whole model. Regardless, Johnson continued to lead the Flat Earth Society, the International Flat Earth Research Society, I should say, until his death in 2001, even after losing his home. His obituary in the LA Times includes a number of his other claims, uh, many of which match the claims made by Flat Earthers, you know, 23 years later. Now, the ones I'm about to give you aren't necessarily ones that match that, but I just, these are the claims that were given. Uh, Stalin and Roosevelt were both clearly flat earthers, proven by their chosen symbol for the United Nations. Now, of course, Roosevelt died six months before the UN was actually founded. It's unclear if he would have had any say whatsoever in the logo, so I, I just don't even know where to go with that one. The UN logo is, of course, a simple planar projection. It's just meant to depict all of the nations of the world. It's not meant to be accurate to the shape of the planet. But if you thought that one was wacky, we're getting deeper. All right, the original Flat Earth Society was founded by Moses at Mount Sinai because if the Earth were round, they'd have fallen off before reaching the Promised Land. And no, I'm not sure what he meant by this. Mount Sinai is nowhere near Antarctica. Jesus, too, was a Flat Earther uh, because he ascended to heaven, and if Earth were a ball, there would be no up or down. It does not seem to have occurred to him that up, down, above, below are all relative terms. You know, there's a... Uh, there's a mountain a few miles from here. It's above me. It's not on top of me. 
I will also say that as I dug deeper and deeper into the research, the, the idea of relativity, and not the theory of relativity, just simple relativity as a concept, seems to be very difficult for a lot of these people. And even Christopher Columbus, famous for underestimating the circumference of the globe, was a flat earther. This is because, despite his documented belief in a globe model, he allegedly knew he'd fall off of a ball. Now, as I have mentioned numerous times in both this part and the first part of the series, Christopher Columbus knew the Earth was a globe. Everybody on his ship knew the Earth was a globe. There were no mutinies because people thought they were going to go off the edge, and he didn't have to convince anybody that the Earth was round to get funding for his voyage. What he had to convince them of was that he could actually make it all the way to Asia. See, the thing is, most, most people back then didn't realize America was here. The Norse knew, but you know what all those intrepid New World explorers didn't know about? Today's partner, Fume. If you've been watching the channel for a while, you know that we have a long-standing partnership with Fume. And the reason we have that partnership is that Fume has a very good mission, and it's a very solid, high-quality product. I've been very open about my struggles with certain bad habits in the past, and I've also taken to other certain bad habits socially when I'm out at the bars. One thing that allows me to still feel like I'm a part of things while I'm out and about with people, being social and whatnot, is this little handy-dandy tool right here. But if you're wondering what this thing actually is, it's an award-winning flavored air device, but that doesn't really tell you anything. To give you the, the skinny on it, this guy is not electronic, it is not a vapor, there is no sort of inhalant whatsoever. It is just air pulled through this little filter back here across an all-natural flavoring stick. Your fume comes apart very simply. You just take this guy off, and then you have your flavor stick right here. Take it out, grab a new one, pop it in like that, uh, do that. And if you want to control the amount of airflow you're getting through your device, you just use this little dial on the back, which is also kind of like its own little fidget spinner thing. Makes a clicky sound. You get it. Instead of bad, fume is good. It's an easy, enjoyable, and even fun way to replace habits that you want to break. And you can even make it look pretty, like, sick and stately on your desk by using the base. This is a separately purchased item, but goes hard. Stopping bad habits is something that we all put off because it's hard, but switching to Fume is easy. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories, and there's no reason that yours can't be one of them. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the Journey Pack today. Head to tryfume.com slash lorelodge or scan the QR code on your screen right now and use code lorelodge to get 10% off your order of the journey pack today. That's tryfum.com slash lorelodge to get 10% off your first order. And you know, while it's wonderful that the internet has brought us the ability to share products and stories and things like that, it also seems to be the only thing that kept flat eartherism going. You see, when Samuel Shenton died back in 1971 or 72, I got conflicting answers on that, he was able to find a successor beforehand in Charles K. Johnson, but Charles Johnson did not have that same privilege. And when he went, the Flat Earth Society, the International Flat Earth Research Society, went with him. The society wasn't dormant for long, reappearing in 2004 as the Flat Earth Society under the leadership of then 26-year-old Daniel Shenton, shockingly of no relation to Samuel Shenton. And this time there would be no paper lists of members stored in flammable boxes. Daniel Shenton was a man of the 21st century, and he went with a far more efficient system of communications, an internet forum. And speaking to Daniel Adam for The Guardian in 2010, Shenton went into some detail about the ways in which his iteration of the Flat Earth movement differed from his predecessors. He acknowledged that medieval people believed the Earth to be round, and that the claims that Columbus had to convince people the Earth wasn't flat were completely fabricated by Washington Irving in 1828. Daniel Shenton also took no issue with Darwinian evolution. He firmly believed in anthropogenic climate change, and he didn't see any sort of conspiracy in the 9-11 attacks, making him oddly mainstream for flat Earth. For Shenton, this was not about interpretations of the Bible or any total distrust in the U.S. government. Rather, Shenton argued, to look around, the world does appear to be flat. So I think it's incumbent on others to prove decisively that it isn't. And I don't think that burden of proof has been met yet. In response to questions about images taken from space, Shenton gave the familiar refrain of, uh, look at what special effects are capable of. You can produce any photograph, any video. I don't think there is solid proof. And yeah, this is gonna be just so much worse from this point on with the way that AI is going. 
here at the Lore Lodge, we kind of feel that the direction AI technology is going in is sort of a, your scientists were so busy figuring out whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think about whether or not they should think. That's, that's chaos theory. He continued, I'm not intentionally being stubborn about it, but I feel our senses tell us these things, and it would take an extraordinary level of evidence to counteract these. How many people have actually investigated it? He asked. Have you? It's an absurd question, of course, because any time that somebody actually bothers to do an experiment to figure out if the Earth is flat or not and finds that it, in fact, isn't, it's just dismissed by flat earthers as being a lie, CGI, or some other nonsense. And Shenta did precisely that, citing the Bedford Level experiments, even though Alfred Wallace proved the curve at that very site in 1870 at the request of a flat earther. So far as I can tell, Shenton is still involved in the leadership of the Flat Earth Society, though he hasn't posted any of its forums from his main account since 2016. The blog on the site also hasn't been updated since 2016, though the forums do remain active, and they're a mix of people debunking the Flat Earth and arguing for the Flat Earth. Sometime in the last 20 years, Flat Earth escaped the bounds of the Flat Earth Society, with several stars rising on their own in the Flat Earth movement. One big name is Mark Sargent, an American IT specialist, who in 2015 began releasing videos on his YouTube channel under the series title Flat Earth Clues, and the YouTube channel is Mark K. Sargent. Today, Sargent has about 105,000 subscribers with 1.6 thousand videos. Another popular creator in the movement is Eric Dubay, who has a slightly larger platform at 206,000 subs, though Flat Earth is not the only thing he talks about. He also has videos on spirituality, health, yoga, music, and conspiracies, such as... A major difference between Daniel Shenton and those who came after him was the level to which the globe theory was a malignant conspiracy. For example, Sergeant and Dubay both make explicit claims that the true nature of the Earth is being deliberately hidden for nefarious reasons. The two men differ somewhat on the exact details of why everything is being hidden, but it generally comes down to a combination of there are resources beyond the ice wall that they don't want us finding out about, and that there is some spiritual thing that would be disproven by going beyond the ice wall. Of course, Dubay and Sargent aren't the only big names out there, but when we debunked the Tartaria conspiracy, I noticed something, which was that the conspiracy theorists in this case, and I'm not using conspiracy theorists in a derogatory way, I'm a conspiracy theorist. I'm just saying the, the, the ones of this specific theory. The conspiracy theorists for the Tartaria conspiracy, I'm saying conspiracy a lot, geez. Uh, they use this sort of fallback plan where every time you would address one person's claims, they would be like, oh, well, that's not our guy, this is our guy. But then when you debunk that person's claims, they say, that's not our guy, this other guy is our guy. So I knew that if I were to debunk Dubay, they would just tell me to go and look at Sargent. And if I debunked Sargent, they would just tell me to go and look at Weiss. And this would keep going on and on in perpetuity until I get annoyed or tired and give up. Of course, to people who know me personally, the idea that I would simply give up on something like this is, has got to be hilarious. I'm probably one of the most stubborn people they know. So to that end, I decided I would go with Eric Dubay, not because I think he's the uh, archetypal flat earther necessarily, but because I watched a bunch of his stuff and I watched a bunch of Sargent's stuff and I watched some of Weiss's stuff and then I read a whole bunch of other stuff and well, I came to the conclusion that Dubay not only has the largest platform and the most written materials, but also has a lot of crossover with everybody else. Dubay has been active since at least 2016, which I believe is the year he published his, uh, his magnum opus of 200 Proofs the Earth is Not a Spinning Ball, a list of arguments that mostly line up with what I saw from Sergeant Weiss and everybody else. Covering all 200 would be pretty time-consuming, but I don't think I really need to do that, since some arguments are built upon the assumption that those which preceded them are true, and others simply ignore relevant information. Part 59 is an example of the latter, asking how it is, if the Earth always rotates at the same speed, that the length of day and night times varies throughout the year. Now, this is something of an argumentative fallacy because he's, he's cherry-picking. He's going and saying, well, how does this work? And pretending that the theory doesn't account for it, because no person who believes the Earth is a spinning globe in space is going to tell you that it doesn't have axial tilt. It's part of the theory. You might ask them to prove that it has axial tilt, and that's a different question, but the idea that the Earth's rotation being steady means that the seasons and daytimes wouldn't vary doesn't make sense because we've accounted for it. 
This would be like me asking, how does the moon work if it's outside of the dome, when flat earthers say that the moon isn't outside of the dome. And then Proof 62 is in the same vein, citing Robottom's bed for level experiment, but failing to address Wallace's refutation, and Proof 63 through 66 follow suit using Robottom's other experiments, all of which had the same exact flaws. Robottom never accounted for atmospheric refraction, placing his telescope only 8 inches to 6 feet above the water level. There were also other issues with his calculations, just simple errors, and I'm about to get into those right now. Because, by the same trend, proof 68 through 96 all deal with things being visible over distances that Dubay claims would be impossible if the Earth were curved using the measurement of 8 inches per mile squared to ascertain curvature. And of course, that is not 8 inches per square mile, it is 8 inches times the number of miles squared. I saw some flat earthers saying that it was eight inches per square mile, and that, that's, that doesn't make sense at all, actually. Now, the first thing that needs to be addressed is Dubay's claim in Proof 6, and then also several others, that this eight inches per mile squared number comes from NASA, because that's not true. This number actually comes from the age of sail, when it was used to determine how far away another ship was based on how much of the mast is visible over the horizon. Dubay also ignores that eight inches per mile squared is a parabolic function, not a circular one, and while a parabola and a circle can have similar arcs at first, they will eventually diverge, though at the distances given, typically this is irrelevant. You know, if we're talking about thousands and thousands of miles, you're gonna see the differentiation. If we're talking about 60 to 100, the parabola and the circular function are, are close enough that it works. There are also further issues with only using the 8 inches per mile squared function because it doesn't account for elevation. It simply accounts for the pure curvature of the Earth. This comes back to bite him in Proof 68, which is based upon a picture of Philly taken from 40 miles away on Apple Pie Hill in New Jersey at an elevation of 205 feet. And now I laughed out loud when I saw him using Philly in Jersey because, oh boy, I, I see that skyline all the time. See, if you look at the picture, taller buildings are visible, but their bases as well as the vast majority of buildings are obscured beneath the horizon. According to Eric, however, the skyline should be hidden behind 335 feet of curvature. This one is absolutely riddled with problems, first among them being that even at eye level, just six feet, uh, the top of the 945 foot tall One Liberty Place building would be visible to the naked eye without any obstructions. In addition to that, at 205 feet of elevation, anything taller than 336 feet should be visible, rendering his entire point moot. Eric clearly does not understand how these calculations work. What I mean by that is that Eric, whatever calculator he's using, or maybe he's doing the calculations by hand, he's not accounting for elevation. He's misunderstanding the number that the calculator is returning to him. When you put an elevation of 205 feet and a target distance of 40 miles into an Earth curvature calculator, it will tell you that the target hidden distance is 336 feet. What that means is that anything shorter than 336 feet will be invisible due to the curvature. And it's, I, I, took, I took a good while, I took probably 20 or 30 minutes trying to figure out where Dubay's logic was here, how he was misunderstanding this calculation. Because to me, it was very clear. 336 feet is the minimum height for something to be visible over the horizon at 205 feet of elevation 40 miles away. It seems that Eric thinks that somehow anything beyond the horizon will be hidden 336 feet behind it, which makes zero sense. How can you have a static distance at which things are invisible if things are different heights? The only way that this equation can actually be interpreted to have any meaning whatsoever is if you understand that what it's saying is from 40 miles away at 205 feet in elevation, anything beyond the horizon that is lower than 336 feet in height will be invisible. And if you look at the picture given, you can see that a solid two-thirds of One Liberty Place are visible. The Comcast building? Even more. There is a uniform cutoff for where you can't see below that point, and it's 336 feet tall. And Dubay makes this mistake again and again and again and again. And when I say Dubay makes this mistake, I mean almost every single flat earther I looked at. And the reason for that is that this, this alone proves the Earth is a sphere. You cannot use this equation in a mathematically correct way 
to prove that the Earth is not round. For example, Proof 69, which is a nice picture, shows New York City shot from the summit of Bear Mountain, 60 miles away, at an elevation of 1,283 feet. And he says it should be obscured behind 170 feet of curvature when, in reality, the calculations work out to show that only buildings taller than 170 feet will be visible. Like I said, with the whole Philadelphia thing, it's the same exact issue. And I mean, just using simple logic, if you think about how tall buildings in New York City are and how tall Bear Mountain is, it makes sense you should be able to see something. Then Proof 70 is actually just funny, with Dubay claiming a picture shot from Washington Rock in New Jersey at 400 feet elevation shows both Philadelphia and New York, even though they're 120 miles apart. And if you're from this area, you probably already know why this is funny. First of all, Philly and New York are only 80 miles apart. But the real kicker is that while that is Manhattan on the left, that's not Philly on the right. It's also Manhattan. This picture shows Manhattan and Manhattan. If you've ever actually seen the skyline of Manhattan, you're, you're probably aware that there's a pretty big gap between the north and south side of the island. Now, personally, I thought that uh, I misunderstood this picture. Aiden had to correct me because he lived in New York for four years. But I thought that it was Manhattan on the left, southern Manhattan, and Brooklyn on the right. He took a look at it and he was like, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's Manhattan on both sides. Which made it even funnier than that being Brooklyn. And anyone who looks at a map will see that it is impossible to take a picture of New York City, Manhattan, which is northeast of Washington Rock, that will also show Philadelphia, which is southwest of Washington Rock. The two cities are in almost completely opposite directions from one another, viewed from Washington Rock. Like, there is basically a 180 degree difference. You could take a panorama and you wouldn't see Philadelphia. Proof 71 shows precisely how little research Eric Dubé actually did on a single one of his claims, centering on a 2015 photo of Chicago taken by Joshua Nowicki from Warren Dunes State Park in Michigan, in which the skyline is largely visible over the lake. We're talking probably a dozen, couple dozen buildings. Probably a couple dozen to three dozen. Dubé claims that this photo proves the Earth is flat because it's 60 miles away using the 8 inches per mile squared calculation. There should be 2,320 feet of curvature, and therefore even Chicago's tallest buildings like the Willis Tower should be invisible. It's actually only 53 miles, but whatever. He also notes that the media quickly claimed the picture to be a superior mirage, implying it was a cover-up. And he says that a superior mirage has to be upside down. I actually didn't even bother to look into that because it doesn't matter. The reason it doesn't matter is that he completely left out that in 2016, Nowicki explicitly told ABC 57 that he'd never seen that much of the skyline before, specifically citing, that's not usually there. Logically, if the reason that you can see Chicago from across Lake Michigan in Warren Dune State Park is because the Earth is flat, then that means that you should always be able to see, in clear conditions, Chicago from 53 miles away in Warren Dune State Park. Since you can't always see that much of Chicago from Warren Dune State Park, that means the reason you're seeing Chicago is not that the Earth is not curved, but because of atmospheric conditions. The photo was also taken around sunset, which increased the amount of refraction immensely. Furthermore, Dubay offers absolutely no explanation for why the bases of the buildings are below the horizon. On a flat Earth model, the entire city should be visible since you're at sea level looking across a flat plane. And before some of you in the comments say it's refraction, you can't say your thing is refraction, but mine's not. That's not how that works. Y you don't get to do selective refraction. Moving along to proofs 72 and 73, these cite old reports from sailors of seeing a 300-foot-tall tower from 70 miles at 10 feet in elevation and a 2,690-foot-tall island from some 75 miles away at an unknown point above sea level. And he provides no source for either claim, aside from giving the names of sea captains who, like, you're gonna... Dude, there's a lot of John Smiths out there. There's a lot of John Gibsons. You're gonna need to give me a specific book. But anyway, these are all claims from the 19th century of, you know, might as well be anonymous sea captains saying they saw something. That's a little different as a proof than a photograph taken in 2015. I should also really say that these are not proofs that the Earth is flat. These are claims and arguments that the Earth is flat. A, a proof, mathematically, is when you show something to be absolutely true through mathematical reasoning. You know, you know, th this is, these are not proofs. If you took these to a courtroom, nobody would say, you know, well, that's, you know, caught him red-handed. 
But anyway, looking at these, which are rather fantastical claims from 18th century, 19th century sea captains, uh, you know, as a historian, it's my opinion that the most likely case here is that they were lying. They were just trying to sound cool. You know, that, that this happens a lot. You know, if we look back throughout history, there, there are all sorts of travel logs. You know, the earliest, the earliest novels, technically, were travel logs. They were supposed to be real, they were written as if they were real, but they would talk about people going to the moon. So without any source or citation whatsoever here, in my experience reading so many historical documents, these captains were probably not telling the truth, or there were weird atmospheric conditions. Moving along to 74 through 77, Debay presents a series of photos which depict the islands of Gorgona, Corsica, Caprea, and Elba from 81, 99, 102, and 125 miles away respectively, which he claims were taken in Genoa, Italy at altitudes of around 70 feet. He says that Gorgana should be 3,372 feet beneath the curve, Corsica 5,245 feet, Caprea 5,605 feet, and Elba 8,770 feet. None of the images have a source listed, so it's very difficult to corroborate DeBay's claims that they were taken from Genoa. So I calculated how high up someone would have to be to see these islands over the curve. Now, Gorgona is 833 feet tall at its highest point, so you'd have to be at an elevation of at least 1,400 feet to see any of it over the curve. So the question is, is it possible to take a picture from 1,400 feet or higher in Genoa? The answer is a resounding yes, with there being multiple peaks of over 1,400 feet immediately surrounding Genoa, meaning Dubé needs to prove the picture was actually taken at just 70 feet. As you can imagine, he does not. And the same issue applies to points 75 through 77. Corsica is 99 miles away with 19 peaks over 6,500 feet tall, meaning it would actually still be visible from 70 feet no matter what, and that only portions below 1,885 feet would be invisible from 1,400 feet. Once again, we need to remember that Dubé does not grasp how this calculation works. He does not understand that the, the number given for target hidden distance is not how far below the curve the top of something will be. It is how, how tall something needs to be to appear over the curve. Oh, and in addition to the fact that even at 70 feet, Corsica would absolutely be visible from Genoa, the picture he provides wasn't taken in Genoa, it was taken in Nice, France. And yes, peaks just outside of Nice also have the necessary elevation. Come on, man, it's the foothills of the Alps. Caprea, on the other hand, is only 1,529 feet above sea level at 102 miles from Genoa, so you'd need to be at over 1,900 feet. But there's something wrong. If you look at the picture, it's impossible that this is properly labeled and also shot from Genoa because Gorgona appears to the right of Elba. And it's important to note here that Elba does is pretty wide compared to Gorgona, but the western part of Elba is absolutely to the west of Gorgona, and that's the part of Elba that's in the picture. So if shooting from Genoa, Gorgona should appear furthest to the left, not second from the left. And this also calls the location of Proof 74's photograph into question, as in that picture as well, Elba appears to the left of Gorgona. Now, Elba is in fact the only island that should be totally invisible from Genoa. It's only 3,343 feet tall and behind 4,180 feet of curvature at 1,400 feet in elevation. Keep in mind, I accounted for elevation. And even after accounting for elevation, you can't see Elba from Genoa. But as we just kind of looked at, chances are these photographs were not taken from Genoa at all. Looking at proofs 75 and 76, it's only possible for the islands to appear in the order that they do if shot from somewhere between Monterosa, El Mara, and La Spazia. La Spezia? La Spezia. And those places are distances of only 93 and 98 miles from Elba, and they have peaks high enough to see Elba over the curve at that distance. The maximum curvature here would be only 1,815 feet at 1,400 feet in elevation, placing Elba well within view at over 3,000 feet tall. Dubé goes on to take us out of the Mediterranean and all the way to Alaska, where he does the same with proof 78 and 79. In these proofs, the mountains Foraker and Denali are shot from 120 and 130 miles away in Anchorage, Alaska at 102 feet elevation. Now, of course, they didn't go to different places in Anchorage, it's just that Denali was 10 miles further away. 
If you do the math using that 102 feet of elevation and that 120 and 130 miles of distance, then what you get is a curvature of 7,724 feet between Anchorage and the base of Foraker and of 9,225 feet between Anchorage and Denali. And again, this is the base of the mountains is where the curvature would be. Foraker is 17,402 feet tall, Denali 20,310 feet tall. So well over 10,000 feet of each mountain should be visible from 102 feet in Anchorage. And just in case it's not something that you're aware of, Denali and McKinley are the same mountain, Denali being the native name, McKinley being the uh, European American name. Proofs 79 through 92 all fall along the same line. Dubé says something shouldn't be visible beyond the curve and that since it is, the earth must be flat. Though the difference is with these proofs, totally citationless anecdotes. And keep in mind, a source and a citation are not the same thing. A source is, Aiden told me something, Aiden's my source. A citation is me writing down, Aiden told me this in this email, written on this date, sent to this address. Eric, if you're listening, a methodology class would be incredibly helpful. In each of these utterly citationless anecdotes, he gives the distance to the structure, the height of said structure, and the estimated curvature, but not the height from which they are visible, which leaves the function incomplete and therefore impossible to corroborate or debunk. In Proof 82, for example, he claims that the 420-foot tall Port Nicholson Lighthouse in New Zealand is visible from 35 miles, despite 220 feet of curvature. No source given. If you reverse engineer his math, which is what I did, you'll find that the top of the tower, the top of the lighthouse, is in fact visible at that distance from an elevation of 65 feet. And 65 feet is well within the normal range for a crow's nest or a lookout spot on an ocean-going sea vessel. Switching gears a little bit, examples 93 through 96 all deal with a lack of perceived horizontal curvature. In Proof 95, for example, he repeats the false claim that the 8 inches per mile squared function comes from NASA, and then he goes on to say that on a clear day from the highland near Douglas Harbor on the Isle of Man, the whole length of the coast of North Wales is often plainly visible to the naked eye. From this, he argues that since it's 50 miles from the mouth of the River Dee to the town of Holyhead on the Isle of Anglesey, the coast should show an easily detectable 416 foot downward curve from the midpoint on each side. Now, keep those words in the back of your mind right now. Easily detectable. Now, first things first, I'm not sure where he's getting the claim that you can see the entire coastline of North Wales from the highlands near Douglas. At the very closest point between the coast and the isle, anything below 341 feet in elevation will be invisible beyond the curve. Now you may be saying, Aiden, your point only makes sense if the Earth is curved. Well, I have a calculation that's proven the Earth to be curved over and over and over and over and over and over again in perpetuity, and Eric Dubé has a random anecdote with no source, no citation, and no image to back it up. If we have any uh, followers, subscribers, who live on the Isle of Man or can get to the Isle of Man and have an iPhone camera, uh, if you wouldn't mind going to the highlands near Douglas and trying to take a picture of the coast of North Wales, on a clear day, I would really appreciate it. I would very much appreciate if you did that. And since, uh, we're gonna get to this later in the video, but since flat earthers seem to think that telescopes bring things back into view, you know, go ahead and bring a telescope too if you want. I'm pretty confident that you're not gonna see the actual coast. You might see some mountains, not gonna see the coast. But more importantly, we gotta talk about this whole easily detectable thing that I asked you to keep in the back of your mind because we're talking about 416 feet of curvature across 25 miles which is just simply imperceptible to the human eye. And that's without considering any other variables. So to demonstrate that, I placed a 50 pixel long line atop a circle with a diameter of 7,917 pixels in order to create a two dimensional basic scale model of the earth. As you can see, the curvature is near indiscernible along the black line. Now that said, you, you can see it a little bit. You, you, if, you're, if you got a good eye, you can see those little pixels up at the top of the line. Now we're talking about like, uh, 416 feet is like 7.8% of a mile. So we're talking less than a pixel on this scale model. And I just want to be clear, I didn't, I didn't stop there. Uh, this, I, I went uh, one pixel to one mile scale, right? So that first picture I showed you, that's 6,000 pixels wide at a scale of one pixel to one mile. But I was curious, at what point do you stop perceiving the circle's curve? So I changed my scale up a little bit and I went one pixel to one tenth of a mile. And as you can see, very rapidly here, at what is now 600 miles across instead of 6,000 miles, the curve is less noticeable, but it's still there. 
So I went to one pixel per one hundredth of a mile. When you look at it at the one pixel to one one hundredth of a mile scale, you get approximately 60 miles. Not approximately, you actually would get exactly 60 miles across the image, and you barely perceive the curvature. It's there, but we're talking about, you know, two degrees of curvature visible between the midpoint and the extreme left of the image. And just because I was curious, I blew it up to an even larger scale. One pixel to one one thousandth of a mile. We are talking about a, a circle that is millions of pixels across. We are talking about a line that I had to make 50,000 pixels across, and therefore, obviously, the vast majority of it did not fit into the largest size canvas I could make. So what you end up getting is a six-mile horizon that is totally flat along what I can guarantee you is a circle. Basically, if you can only see six miles of the horizon, you won't see a curve at all. If you can see 60 miles of the horizon, you'll see about two degrees of curvature on either side. If you're looking at 600 miles of horizon, then you're starting to be able to really look at it and go, yeah, that's curved as hell. But wait, there's more. If we go back to proofs 60 and 61, they also directly relate to this same lack of perceived curvature. Proof 60, which I believe is taken right from Robottom, argues anyone can prove the, su the sea horizon perfectly straight and the entire earth flat using nothing but a level, tripods, and a wooden plank from just 6 to 12 feet above sea level. His argument is that the distant horizon will always align perfectly parallel with the upper edge of the board. The reason is that at 6 feet up, the horizon is only 3 miles off, while at 12 feet, it increases to only 4.24 miles away. Now let's do some math. The first thing we need to establish is that the distance to the horizon is not a straight line in all directions. The horizon isn't three miles from you there, but four miles from you there. It is three miles from you all around your field of view. Since the horizon is a circle around you, that means that it has a circumference, and that means that we can calculate not just the total distance of the horizon, but also if we have, you know, the exact angle of your vision, we could calculate even the section you're looking at. Doing the calculations, we find that at a elevation of six feet with a horizon distance of three miles, the horizon, the total horizon circumference around you is only 18.85 miles. And if we increase it to 12 feet, well, then it's, you know, horizon of 4.24 miles, which when you do the calculation gets us to a total circumference of 26.64 miles. And if we know the viewing angle, we can calculate exactly what you can see on the horizon as a section of the circle, but we actually don't even need to do that because, as our scale model shows, at something less than 30 miles, let alone something less than the, you know, six and a half miles to eight miles that should be visible if you take a segment of this circle, the, the curve is imperceptible. You can't see it. You physically cannot see far enough along the horizon to get even a degree of curvature. When I tell you this is the first time I have done anything even approaching geometry since I was in... Possibly, well, is trigonometry geometry? I don't know, I'm not a mathematician. My point is I haven't done math in a really long time and I figured this out. In Proof 61, Dubé makes a similar yet somehow even worse argument and it's not just because he spells pizza as pizza with one Z. It's because he doesn't even try to use math and the entire claim reads as follows. If the Earth were actually a big ball 25,000 miles in circumference, the horizon would be noticeably curved even at sea level. Now, um, before I proceed, we just proved that's not the case. Like, proved. Mathematically proved. Th there, is, there is no questioning it. The math is sound. But he continues, and everything on or approaching the horizon would appear to tilt backwards slightly from your perspective. Distant buildings along the horizon would all look like leaning towers of Pisa falling away from the observer. Again, he spelled Pisa wrong, which I just think is funny. Anyway, uh, he then also goes on to say that things should disappear over the horizon top first, but since they don't, the Earth is flat, which is the exact opposite of, like, things disappear bottom first over the horizon, which is one way to tell that it's round. But anyway, moving along. If you look back to our scale model, we can also use it this way, because if your target distance is 300 miles, you are only going to get a curvature of about two degrees. And by target distance, I mean a straight line. I don't mean even accounting for the curve. I mean straight line. I mean that if the building you're trying to perceive is 300 miles that way, then there are only two degrees of curvature between you and the building you cannot easily perceive two degrees of curvature if you're looking at something vertical in front of you. 
I mean, just to give you an example, we're talking about like this versus this. See? Then this is horizontal. Ready? This. And I'm not using a protractor. I'm probably off by a bit. This versus this. Right? See how minor that is? Now try and perceive it this way. Can you, can you tell? All right, here, here quick. What, what angle am I holding the fume at? Hmm, could you tell? Probably not. And if you say yes, you're lying. The monitor's right there. I can see it. Now, if you're wondering why I started with proof 59 instead of starting with the beginning at 1, it's because I wanted to get all of that out of the way before we dove into his first few arguments. I say that because we needed to establish that there is absolutely, definitively, positively a curve before we addressed these. Going back to the beginning, proofs 1 and 2 are a problem for the same reason as proofs 61, 62, and 93 through 96. With Dubay claiming, the horizon always appears flat 360 degrees around the observer regardless of altitude, even at 20 miles high. As we have already established, this is not true. And when I say this is not true, I mean that the horizon always appears 360 degrees flat in every direction. That starts to change as you get higher and higher into the atmosphere. Now, the number he gives is 20 miles, so we're going to work with that for a minute. As evidence, Dubay provides several images which allegedly show the horizon to be perfectly straight at any altitude. The pictures are largely unsourced and unlabeled, and several are panoramic. Now, that's a problem because panoramas are not singular images. They are composites. You hold a camera, and it takes a picture here, 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 here. And then stitches them all together, either physically or digitally, to present a super wide frame. You could do a 360-degree panorama, you could do a 180-degree panorama. But no matter what the full width of the panorama is in terms of degrees, it is made up entirely of shots that have smaller fields of view. Let's say you have an ultra-wide camera lens that gets you a 120-degree field of view. And let's say that your camera is at 12 feet in elevation. Each photograph will only show 8.88 miles of the horizon. And as our scale model shows, you can't perceive the curve when the horizon is this small. There simply aren't enough degrees of curvature for you to see it. So, because of the way that panoramic images are formed, you shouldn't expect a panoramic shot to show the Earth's curvature. Each frame in the composite will not have enough visible horizon to perceive even a degree of curvature. But of course, as you get higher and higher, the visible horizon becomes larger and larger. It gets wider and wider. So that's why, as you go further up in altitude, you can begin to see the curve of the Earth. The shots that aren't panoramic are very low resolution, and they lack essential information like altitude, horizon distance, how much of the horizon is actually visible, and only one of them provides anything at all, which is that it says it's 20 miles above the Earth. We can use the same math that we used for proof 60 to determine how much of the curve we should actually be able to see at 20 miles of elevation. At 20 miles of elevation, or 105,600 feet, the horizon should be approximately 398 miles away. And we can do the same thing, we can take the radius, we can find the circumference, and what we get is that the total horizon around you at that point should be about 2,500 miles. Now, if we knew the exact type of camera, the lens size that was used to take this image, we could actually figure out the exact amount of horizon that's visible. But, since we don't have that, I decided to give them the benefit of the doubt and go with a wide-angle lens, which should give us about 84 degrees of what is in front of us. This is actually pretty simple math, because it's a circle. All you have to do is divide 84 by 360, and then multiply that number by the total circumference, which gets you about 583 miles. If you then go over to the scale model, which is, again, one pixel to one mile, then place your 583 pixel line atop your 7,917 pixel in diameter circle at the midpoint, then what you'll find if you draw a vertical line from the end point of your first line and a diagonal line between the end points of your two lines, you will get the number of degrees of curvature, in this case, two. And again, that's if you're using a wide-angle lens. I don't know what kind of lens these guys were using. Now, if you look at the picture, it's so incredibly blurry that it's hard to tell where the horizon line even is, but I'd wager that, you know, considering we've been right about everything else so far, if you took a clearer image from that altitude, you'd probably see about four degrees of curvature. And I know, I know, if you're a flat earther watching this video, you're, you're sitting there thinking, ha, we got him. 
but in reality, you supplied a super blurry picture and tried to use it as evidence that there wasn't a curve. You can't tell if there's a curve. I can't tell if there's a curve. There may be a curve, there may not be a curve. It's Schrodinger's curve. Based on that image, you can't tell definitively one way or the other, and on top of that, he doesn't give a real source for the image, a date that it was taken, any sort of other measurements. There's like, we don't know what kind of camera it was. I mean, after all, this picture could have been taken with like a 50 millimeter lens, and that could be why we have so little in frame. And with a 50 millimeter lens, you absolutely wouldn't see curvature. In all honesty, it's my opinion that these images are simply too low resolution to draw any conclusions from. Especially considering that what we're looking at here should be single digits of curvature. But if you thought that, you know, that little bit of evidence from the Flat Earth community was bad, it gets worse because Eric Dubé follows this up with an impressive lack of understanding regarding topography and basic concepts of elevation in proofs 3 through 12. What I mean by that is that proofs 3, 4, 5, and 8 all deal with water, specifically canals and rivers. Proof three is about the whole water always finds its level argument, with Dubé writing, the natural physics of water is to find and maintain its level. If Earth were a giant sphere, tilted, wobbling, and hurtling through space, then truly flat level surfaces would not exist here. What Dubé fails to understand is that level is a relative term that is not always synonymous with the word flat. And it seems like a lot of the confusion within the flat Earth community comes from the use of the term sea level. Because, of course, as with many English words, the word level has multiple definitions. It can be used in a number of different ways. For example, in video games, we say that you progress through levels. Those are not progressing through flats. They are progressing through stages of experience. In topography, however, level means that something has a uniform elevation, which the oceans, on average, do. And because the oceans are all relatively level to one another, that is typically used as the baseline for elevation. Sea level is zero feet in elevation. So when we say that the surface of a lake or a canal is level, we don't mean that it has no curve. We mean that it's at a uniform elevation above sea level. And based on everything we talked about previously, if you wanted to see the curve on a lake, the lake would have to be hundreds of miles wide and you'd have to be able to have a lens that could perceive enough of it. With that covered, let's look at his arguments, starting with proof four, which reads, rivers run down to sea level, finding the easiest course north, south, east, west, and all other intermediary directions over the earth at the same time. And he reasons this to mean that if the earth were truly a spinning ball, then many of these rivers would be impossibly flowing uphill, and he does not explain his reasoning. What he does do is give the example of the Mississippi, saying the river in its 3,000 miles would have to ascend 11 miles before reaching the Gulf of Mexico. First of all, the Mississippi is only 2,340 miles long. But more importantly, it never flows uphill at any point. This is because the headwaters of the Mississippi are at Lake Itasca, which is at 1,466 feet above sea level. The Gulf of Mexico, obviously, is at zero. So, downhill the whole way. And because water follows the easiest course, that means it's finding the easiest course from 1400 down to zero. So at no point is it going to try to flow uphill, it'll find a way to flow around the obstruction, which is what the Mississippi does. In proof five, he gives further examples, claiming that the Nile at one point flows 1000 miles while only descending one foot in elevation, and that the same is true of other long rivers. As usual, there is no source for any of these claims, and I was not able to find out what he meant by there's a section of the Nile which runs for a thousand miles while only descending one foot. I'm also not sure why he seems to think that's so strange, like impossible. Yeah, it's definitely would be impressive, but still descending. Either way, the headwaters of the Nile out of Lake Victoria are at 4,373 feet, and the river then flows 4,132 miles to the Mediterranean at zero feet. And I'm still not really sure where he came up with the whole 1,000 miles and one foot thing. I looked it up and I didn't really get anything. Uh, what, what I wonder is, was he using the... Was he trying to divide the number of miles by the elevation? Because in that case, you would get closer to one mile per foot, or one foot per mile. I don't know. What I do know is that the Nile flows downhill all the way from Lake Victoria to the Mediterranean. It may simply be that our buddy Eric here hasn't figured out that curvature and elevation are different things, the curve being measured at sea level, and the elevation being, by definition, measured above sea level. Although technically something is, could be below sea level as well, so...
He also doesn't really get how canals work, and for much the same reason. For proof 8, he writes, the Suez Canal connecting the Mediterranean with the Red Sea is 100 miles long without any locks, making the water an uninterrupted continuation of the two seas. Arguing that the Earth's curvature was not accounted for when the canal was dug, he proceeds to prove himself wrong in the very next sentence. That sentence reads, It was dug along a horizontal datum line 26 feet below sea level, passing through several lakes, with the datum line and water surface running perfectly parallel over the 100 miles. Of course, by choosing to dig the canal 26 feet deep relative to sea level, they accounted for the curve, because sea level remains relatively constant over the curve. Because the area is pretty uniform in elevation, locks were not needed like they are on the Panama Canal, which cuts through a mountain range and a high elevation lake. But if you thought it was only about water, think again, because trains and bridges also get mentioned. Proof 10 claims that the 180 mile long London Northwestern Railway should, at its center, arc up by over a mile. Once again, Dubay is completely unable to grasp the fact that curvature and elevation are not the same thing, and on top of that, his source is not reliable. The quote is from the 1901 book Terra Firma, The Earth Not a Planet Proved from Scripture, Reason, and Fact by David Wardlaw Scott, who was not in any way by any stretch of the imagination an engineer. This same line of argument also appears in proofs 7, 9, 11, and 12, all of which claim some variation of engineers don't account for curvature when building canals, bridges, or railways. Proof 7 states, without any evidence whatsoever, that surveyors, engineers, and architects are never required to factor the supposed curvature of the Earth into their projects. This is false, one example being the Humber Bridge, a 1.38 mile long suspension bridge in the UK, the towers of which are 1.4 inches further apart at their tops than at their bases, even though both are perfectly vertical. Proof 9 quotes Engineer W. Winkler as being published in The Earth Review, his contribution being the claim that, as an engineer of many years, no engineer would dream of allowing anything of the kind. Now, so far as I can tell, Winkler was a railway engineer who was born in India to an English family, moved to London and lived there for about 40 years before moving to Canada. Now, that would seem to be a reliable source, but we'll get there. Proof 12 also deals with a quote from The Earth Review. Allegedly, the Manchester Ship Canal Company had an article published in The Earth Review which stated, It is customary in railway and canal construction for all levels to be referred to a datum, which is nominally horizontal. It is not the practice in laying out public works to make allowances for the curve of the Earth. Now, of course, the way that they determined that the datum was nominally horizontal was by measuring its elevation in relation to sea level. This, by definition, accounts for the curve. I also need to note something else, which is that in proofs 9 and 12, Dubay did something a little naughty in calling it the Earth Review, because that makes it sound like it's a peer-reviewed journal. In reality, the publication that he was referring to was the Universal Zetetic Society's The Earth Not a Globe review. And it does get better than that. Remember how in Proof 9, Dubé attributed that quote to the engineer W. Winkler? Not quite right. The quote was not from Winkler himself, but rather from a contributor or possibly even an editor of The Earth Not a Globe review, writing under the name A. Huttentot, who simply claimed Winkler said this. When asked in a letter to the editor where the quote was from so that another member of the Universal Zetetic Society could go and find it to corroborate its existence, well, A. Hottentot responded by saying, I am unable to say where I got the quotation from. By the way, I believe that A. Hottentot is probably a pseudonym for a number of reasons, one of which is that this is apparently, as I found out, a derogatory term in South Africa. I was unable to find a surname of Hottentot in any English-speaking country. Now, if we look at proof 12, and of course, no issue of the Earth Review was given, because if we gave the issue number of the Earth Review, anyone reading the quote would realize that what they were actually reading was the total nonsense of a bunch of late 19th century lunatics writing in their, what was essentially, you know, private group chat. By the way, I found some issues of their paper, and it's exactly what you'd expect. It's just a bunch of total nonsense. No science, no logic, no reason, just denial of reality. The only science involved seemed to just be numerous quotations of Robotum and other men like him, who, again, had their experiments totally debunked. But as I was saying, he never gives issue numbers, dates, any of that. Anyway, in Proof 12, he said that the Manchester Ship Canal Company had written the article. And I will say, 
very possible that somebody who worked for the Manchester Ship Canal Company wrote that article. However, there was no name given, at least not in Dubay's work, and I could not track down the actual issue of the periodical that had this in it. But in reading it, I would argue, based on the fact that they clearly don't understand how datum lines work, that whoever wrote this was not an engineer and not a spokesperson for the company, but probably somebody who worked closely enough with the engineering terms to know how to use them in a way that sounded correct, how to use them confidently, but not to actually understand what they meant. These are people who may have known the purpose of a datum line, but not necessarily how it functioned. And that could be anybody from your common day laborer to the foreman, but not an engineer. Proof 11 then follows the exact same trend, citing an unnamed civil engineer in the Birmingham Weekly Mercury as claiming that engineers do not account for the Earth's curvature when laying rail lines. Now, the paper itself was a tabloid, and the so-called engineer can't be proved to be what he said he was because nobody actually gave a name. None of that matters anyway, because an actual civil engineer, John Hanks' 1869 field book for railroad engineers, an entire chapter is dedicated to accounting for the Earth's curvature. You can read it online, the chapter starts on page 84. Or you can find the same information in Frederick Walter Sims' A Treatise on the Principles and Practice of Leveling, but it's buried really deep in there, all the way on page six. I, I know, I know, I'm giving you a Herculean task. It's gonna be really hard to find this page, six pages in. I do wanna give some credit to the website flatearth.ws because I was able to find a lot of uh, these references over there. It would have taken me a very long time well, actually, it probably wouldn't have taken me a very long time to track down an 1800s railway handbook, but this saved me time. That said, did not use the website extensively throughout this process, only for a few things when I was like, hmm, maybe they have a source I can check, because I don't just believe whatever the internet tells me, I always go back and read the actual source. But even if we ignore the, you know, books written by actual railway engineers about railway engineering, we still have basic reasoning. What I mean by that is that with a curvature of 8 inches per mile squared, we're talking about a total curvature of about 0.0015 inches, or 3 two thousandths of an inch, per foot. This would be inconsequential for flexible steel rails, which typically are made in lengths of 80 feet or less, and that means that we're talking about, at, at the very longest here for standard railways, 1.2 inches of curvature across 80 feet. That is well within what a railway can handle. With all of that said, Dubay is now down to only 151 proofs that the Earth is not a spinning ball, proofs 59 through 96 and 1 through 12 being firmly refuted. But before we kind of switch gears to looking at a different side of his argument, I want to quickly touch on 13 and 14 because they're just terrible arguments. Proof 13 is quoted nearly word for word from Robottom, and it says, in a 19th century French experiment by M. M. Biod and Arago, a powerful lamp with good reflectors was placed on the summit of Desierto de las Palmas in Spain and able to be seen all the way from Campre on the island of Ibiza. Since the elevation of the two points were identical and the distance covered nearly 100 miles, if the Earth were a ball 25,000 miles in circumference, the light should have been more than 6,600 feet below the line of sight. Once again, Robottom and Dubay's calculations failed to account for viewing elevation, which makes sense because they had their terms wrong in the first place. There is no Campre on Ibiza. There is, however, a Camp Vell on Ibiza. And when I say there's no Campre on Ibiza, I mean that there in, is no Campre in any language. But I did look into it and I found some good references as well as a good breakdown of the argument on Metabunk. Shout out to uh, the closed account, Rory, over on Metabunk. Your stake profile picture made me giggle. Unfortunately for Flat Earthers, the summit of Desierto de las Palmas, a peak called Bartolo, is 2,392 feet above sea level, and Camp Vell is only 1,312 feet above sea level. Using our calculations, at least 200 feet of Camp Vell should still be visible. It's also important to note that Dubay changed Robottom's wording quite a bit here. He changed it from, uh, there was a trigonometric operation when Robottom was explaining it, and Dubay changes it to a French experiment. Additionally, Robottom says that the points were very near to each other in terms of elevation, whereas Dubay changes it to identical in elevation. Robottom was wrong in the first place because, again, he didn't actually know where Camp Ray, Camp Vell, was. Furthermore, if you read what Dubay says, he says that the elevations were identical, but Robottom didn't say that. He said that the elevations were almost the same. 
And of course, he was wrong, because 2392 and 1312 are not the same thing. One is nearly twice the other. And when I say nearly, I'm actually right about it. In addition to that, Biot and Arago weren't trying to prove the Earth flat, but actually measuring its curve in order to find the exact length of their cool new unit of measurement, the meter. Dubé does almost the exact same thing in Proof 14, referencing an experiment for which he did not actually bother to account for elevation in his analysis. So as you can see, literally every single argument Dubé made in regards to the Earth's curvature measurements, and what level is, and water flowing downhill, and whether or not railway engineers account for curvature, every point he made, he was objectively, provably incorrect. The reason I chose to start with the proofs that I used is because I wanted to make one thing crystal clear. All flat earth arguments are built upon pillars of sand. Proof 139, for example, argues, since ships invisible to the naked eye can sometimes be brought back into view using a telescope, the earth must be flat. That's a paraphrase for the record. I gave you the proof. You can. I, I suggest actually having the proofs up next to you so you can read them as I go through them. But once again, the argument is that ships that are so distant that they're invisible to the naked eye can be brought back into view using a telescope, the Earth must be flat. We already demonstrated that the Earth is absolutely, definitively curved in the first, you know, however long that was of this video. We also showed that it pretty generally follows that 8 inches per mile squared rule. Of course, there are more variables that go into it that we used that, for some reason, Dubé did not understand. And once again, I, I know it's going to be in the comments, but... Dubé makes the same arguments as a whole lot of other people, especially these ones. And part of the reason that I chose these ones is because it doesn't matter what you get in space. I don't need to use space to prove the Earth is round. I can do it right here. I didn't even go outside to prove the Earth is round. I did it at a computer that's right there. And one example of how that whole system of using logic to debunk these points based on the given facts works is that no matter what you use to view a ship as it's sailing away from you, it will always disappear over the horizon, hull first, then mast. Of course, this is so long as conditions permit you to view out that far. If a ship is invisible to the naked eye, yet fully visible to a telescope, the issue is not the curvature of the Earth. The issue is the resolution of your vision. Sometimes things are so far out that your eyes just cannot make them out. Moving along to proofs 154 through 156, Dubé argues that all images of curved horizons taken from high altitudes, such as those from Felix Baumgartner's 2012 jump from 127,852 feet, are the result of fisheye lenses uh, or curved windows. As we already demonstrated, the Earth is a sphere. That is not up for debate. We use the very same math that the flat earthers use, we just actually comprehended how to use the calculation. And as for why you don't see a ton of curvature, even up at 127,000 feet, well, it's because you need to be able to see a whole hell of a lot of horizon. As we proved earlier in the video using basic geometry and a scale model, you need to be able to see at least 583 miles of horizon to be able to perceive just two degrees of curvature. Proofs 42, 43, 44, 49, 51, 57, 111, and 145 all deal with Antarctica in some sense. All but Proof 145 alluded to the suggestion that Antarctica is in fact an ice wall, but since we prove the Earth is a sphere, that means Antarctica can't be an ice wall that surrounds the entire planet. Like, it just, again, I need to make this crystal clear to any Flat Earthers who are still watching, and, and if you are, I commend you, but we proved the Earth is a sphere. It's, it's a done deal. Mathematically. And again, I'm sorry to harp on the whole Earth is a sphere thing and we proved the Earth is a sphere thing, but it's, it's important, because at this point in the discussion, we're beyond that. It's no longer about what the shape of the Earth is. It's a sphere. Well, it's an oblate spheroid, but it's a sphere. We proved that. We used the same math you guys do. The issue was that people like Eric Dubé do not actually understand what the result of the equation means. It does not mean that everything is going to be hidden behind that curvature. It means anything shorter than that figure given when you complete the, the calculation will not be visible. Anything taller will be visible. So when Dubé goes through all of these, and when other flat earthers go through all of these images and things and say, oh, well, you can see this that's this far away, but it should be hidden behind this much curvature. Without fail, the problem is not that the math shows it should be hidden behind curvature, but that they don't understand 
how the math works or what they're supposed to be seeing. But anyway, the main point there is Antarctica can't be an ice wall because the Earth is not flat. Where we're really getting to at this point is no longer is the Earth a sphere or is it flat, we're on to like geocentrism now. Is, is the Earth the center of everything? Does it actually revolve around the sun? Uh, does the moon revolve around us? Who knows, the great mystery, we do know, but that's not the point. But in any case, the point here is that because the Earth is a sphere, Antarctica cannot be an ice wall. But some may ask, well, if Antarctica isn't an ice wall and they're not trying to hide something beyond it, why don't flights go through the Southern Hemisphere or over it? Don't worry, I'm getting there. Because first I gotta point out that a number of proofs just defy gravity, but since we've demonstrated that the Earth is in fact a sphere, something must be keeping us on it. Proofs 23, 32, 33, 115, 116, 117, 118, 157, 158, 160, and 195 all attempt to argue against the concept in various ways, but 116 is the key. That's because proof 116 claims that there has never been a single experiment in history showing an object massive enough to, by virtue of its mass alone, cause a smaller mass to orbit around it. The problem is that that is not correct. Technically, taking out your telescope, pointing it at the sun, and asking yourself, hmm, will Mercury traverse the sun, is an experiment. If you watch Mercury traverse the sun multiple times, you have repeated your experiment. Now, it's an observational experiment, but that's not the point. The hypothesis of the experiment would be, if I point a telescope towards the sun, I should see Mercury traverse it. And the experiment would be putting a telescope, pointing it at the sun, and seeing if Mercury traverses it. The next step is repetition. If you repeat it and you keep seeing Mercury traverse the sun, and it only does it in one direction, that means Mercury is orbiting the sun. And that means that we have experiments proving that objects, by their mass alone, can force smaller objects to orbit around them. Since we can prove that gravity does in fact exist, all proofs based upon the denial of the existence of gravity are moot. But outside of the arguments that are founded upon false suppositions, there are also a bunch that are just bad. For example, proofs 179 through 186, 22 through 33, and several other miscellaneous ones here and there, all argue that the Earth is not spinning, but stationary. Since we've demonstrated that the Earth is a sphere, and we've demonstrated that there are things which orbit the Sun which do not orbit the Earth, it follows that the Earth must be spinning. This is the only way that the sun could rise and set. If the Earth were stationary, then the sun would never rise and set. And then there's Foucault's pendulum to deal with. So, you know, aside from the observational stuff, we can look at the experimental. But don't underestimate Dubé. He does know about Foucault. In Proof 140, Dubé argues that Foucault's pendulum actually proves the Earth is flat and stationary by claiming they don't always... <laughs> by claiming that the pendulums don't always swing uniformly and sometimes they don't swing at all. Of course, this was Foucault's entire point that in the Northern Hemisphere, the pendulum will slowly move, I think clockwise, yeah, as it swings, and that in the Southern Hemisphere, it'll slowly move counterclockwise as it swings. At the equator, it shouldn't move at all. So Dubé, by saying, well, the pendulum doesn't always swing the same way and sometimes it doesn't swing at all, is in fact totally proving Foucault's point. He also makes the very odd argument that the direction that it will swing depends on the initial motion that caused it to move, which is not true because over time it will correct itself. If you were to push it starting counterclockwise in the Northern Hemisphere, then over time it would eventually stop rotating at all and then start rotating clockwise. This is due to the Coriolis effect, which in layman's terms is when moving objects are deflected towards the equator, pulling things like pendulums slightly to the right or left depending on latitude. Proofs 43 through 48 all ask the same general question, which is what's up with Southern Hemisphere flight paths? Dubé asks why there are no direct flights between the cities of Santiago and Sydney, Cape Town and Buenos Aires, Santiago and Johannesburg, and why are all the connecting flights through the Northern Hemisphere? There's a very simple answer to this question. There are direct flights from Santiago to Sydney, and you can travel between Cape Town and Buenos Aires, as well as Santiago and Johannesburg, without ever leaving the Southern Hemisphere. There are flight paths that do that. But by now you may be asking, well, why do all of the connecting flights go through the Northern Hemisphere? For example, Sydney goes to LAX before going to Santiago. And to that, I'd just like to say that it's not every day you get to introduce a 40-year-old man to the concepts of supply and demand. 
A simple explanation could be that there are more people interested in flying from Australia to California than there are interested in flying from Australia to Chile. It could also be that there's a lot of people who want to fly from California to Chile, so the airlines decide, you know what, makes the most sense to do this layover. There were a few other flight paths that he used in this proof, but I, several of them just far exceeded the range of a jetliner, and some of the others just had the same issue, where you could either go in and out without leaving the Southern Hemisphere, or there wasn't supply and demand that drove the airlines to fly all in the Southern Hemisphere. I think one example was that Santiago to Johannesburg stops in London frequently, which would just make sense if there were people who wanted to fly from Chile to England instead of from Chile to South Africa. The airlines are just going to do whatever is going to make them the most money. It's not about the earth being flat or the government saying no. I do have to give Dubay credit because he sounds a lot less insane here than Mark Sargent, who has a video claiming that there are no tracked flights over the Southern Hemisphere. And yes, you heard me correctly. He argues in his video, I think it's called Hiding God in his Flat Earth series, his Flat Earth Clue series, he argues that there are, he, he doesn't even argue, he just straight up says that flight trackers don't track flights over the Southern Hemisphere. That's wrong. It's objectively incorrect. You can go on any flight tracking website and you will find flights over the Southern Hemisphere. One place where you can see that this is verifiably incorrect is if you just go on any flight radar service and look at Australia, which is in the Southern Hemisphere and has flights on it. The same can be said of South Africa and South America. You can watch flights going over them. I, I don't know where Sargent got that idea. He's just flat out wrong. I'm sorry. But perhaps my absolute favorite proof is Proof 190, which claims that before Pythagoras, the idea of a spinning ball Earth was non-existent, and even after Pythagoras, it remained an obscure minority worldview until 2,000 years later when Copernicus began reviving the heliocentric theory. Now, almost everything about that statement is simply objectively, verifiably false. I mean, first of all, Pythagoras never theorized that the Earth was spinning or that it was revolving around the Sun. That was not him. Additionally, the globe model was not a minority worldview for 2,000 years between Pythagoras and Copernicus. It was the generally accepted theory in the entire Greek-speaking world, and then it was adopted by Rome, and then it was adopted by everyone that Rome conquered. So, just blatant historical illiteracy. Just for fun, though, let's, let's say Dubé was right. Let's, let's ask the fun question. Who would be hiding all of this, and to what end? To what end? Well, as you can imagine, it's, uh, it's, it's me who's hiding it, or at least me and all my, my Freemason buddies. What do I mean by that? Well, according to Eric Dubé's Proof 191, not only were Newton, Kepler, Galileo, and Copernicus all Freemasons, but Pythagoras too. And it doesn't stop there, because Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong, Mike Collins, and even NASA director Fred Kleinnecht were or are also Masons. In fact, Kleinnecht was the Grand Commander of the 33rd Degree. Naturally, of everyone in that first group that Dubé gave us, only Newton was a known Freemason. And so far as records show, neither Michael Collins nor Neil Armstrong were Freemasons. Kinda throws a wrench in things, off to a bad start. Out of all the people you mentioned, only two of them were Freemasons. Buzz Aldrin was in fact the first Freemason on the moon, though. And we are gonna be doing a moon video, it's gonna be coming out the week of July 20th. Now, Dubé does provide some evidence that Galileo and Kepler were Freemasons, and, and it's pretty hard-hitting. These are images of Kepler holding a compass and Galileo with his hand over his lower chest. Dubé provides absolutely no reasoning for how that connects Galileo to Freemasonry. And it apparently never crossed Eric Dubé's mind that an astronomer might have a perfectly logical, reasonable, legitimate use for holding a compass. An astronomer. In case it wasn't perfectly clear, Eric Dubé knows absolutely nothing about Freemasonry, which is evidenced by his blog post on the topic, which is basically a smattering of quotes from random authors and a bunch of baseless claims that he makes. And, and, and it's, it's not even, like, up for debate. For example, uh, he shows a Masonic Eye of Providence from a Connecticut Blue Lodge uh, next to the one on the dollar, and he has the caption, Coincidence? Not at all. Which, like, yeah. No kidding. Thing is, the Eye of Providence is a Christian symbol, and the United States government adopted it before the Freemasons did. He also recites a mixture of Masonic legend and anti-Masonic propaganda, all the while getting everything from the history to the function of the order wrong. 
For example, he wrongly claims that you can only advance to higher degrees than the third if you are invited to do so, uh, the idea of higher degrees already being a misconception. And he also implies that Thomas Jefferson was a 33rd degree Mason, when Thomas Jefferson, if anything at most, was an entered apprentice because he didn't find it particularly interesting. It just wasn't his thing. We have no evidence that Thomas Jefferson ever made it past the first degree, and it's iffy if he made it past the, if he even got the first. Also on the list of US presidents who are or were also Masons, he includes Barack Obama and a couple of others who also definitely were not Masons. There's also Proof 198, which implies that the squaring compass is a disguised Star of David and outright claims that the Masons worked with the Illuminati to form a new world order in the 18th century. Don't worry, I'll hit the Star of David thing in like 30 seconds. If you've seen our video on the history of the Illuminati, you'll know why that is an utterly hilarious claim to say that the Masons and the Illuminati were working together. Nobody has more reason to hate the Illuminati than the Freemasons because the Illuminati tried to hijack our fraternity and make everyone an atheist. If you do know anything about Freemasonry, you're probably aware that belief in a supreme being, a creative being, is required to join. Now, we do have a video on Freemasonry coming out in a couple weeks, so I'm gonna leave this bit here for now and we'll pick it up when we get over to that, because I wanna hit one last thing. If you dig just a teensy tiny bit on Eric Dubay's website, you will quickly realize the man is a Nazi. And I don't mean, I don't mean to say, like, you know, that hyperbolically. The guy is literally a Nazi. He, he, he is a Nazi. He believes the Nazis were the good guys. Like, I'm not exaggerating, the guy has posts on his blog that I couldn't even describe without risking a community guidelines violation. But to kind of give you a vague sense of what it is, and you can go to his website if you want to see, but to give you a vague sense of what it is, he claims that a certain Austrian Charlie Chaplin lookalike was a hero. Now, of course, uh, I'm not gonna say that all Flat Earthers are neo-Nazis just because this one moron is, but it did need to be said that, you know, Flat Earth is not just some little, you know, silly, cute conspiracy theory. It's not inconsequential. It's a gateway. It is a gateway drug to that. It is a gateway drug to Tartaria. And Tartaria is a gateway drug to that, again, because uh, you go watch the Tartaria videos if you need to understand that. We covered it pretty in depth. but. I usually have a little bit longer of a conclusion. Unfortunately, the card I have is down to like five minutes and uh, Aiden is not here to replace it. So with all of that said, we're gonna hit Freemasonry very soon. We are hitting the moon landing this summer. We've got a whole bunch of new missing persons content coming out as we get deeper and deeper into the smiley face killers theory. And uh, there's a couple other surprises down the line. Um, uh, yeah, I think that covers just about all of the announcements I would need to make. If you want to get more announcements at other times other than in this video, go join our Discord at bit.ly slash join the lodge. You might want to slow down this part of the video so that you can catch what I'm saying. If you want to support what we're doing here on The Lore Lodge, you can go to patreon.com slash The Lore Lodge and follow us on Patreon. You can subscribe for $1 a month or up to $100 a month. It is your choice. You can also become a member here on YouTube. That is $5 a month, and it doesn't really get you anything special like hoodies or t-shirts or whatever, but it is, you know, it's nice. And it'll get you access to Drunk Folklore, a show that is coming back on our Patreon live very soon. Patreon and YouTube, you'll be able to get it if you are a member of either. We also just signed a merch deal with Bunker Branding. We're going to be doing branding through them. They're going to be handling our merch for the time being and for the foreseeable future. We do are uh, we are very excited to bring them on. We are very excited to work with them, and we uh, we we can't wait to bring you good American-made products. We also have our coffee from Tableau Roasting Company. I designed it myself. You can get it. It's Mount Hope No Burke. Go to the link in the description. It's tableauroastingco.com. You can also follow us in other places. We have other shows. I'm on Instagram as at the Aiden Mattis, as well as on TikTok. Or you can check us out here on YouTube. We have the Lore Lodge, the Weird Bible, Aiden Mattis, uh, the History Hut, and a few other channels that are coming in that are in the works. If you like hearing our discussions, you can catch them live. We have a new format to the show. We now have every other week is going to be a little bit more of a, a loose conversation about the topics we've covered in the past two weeks. And then on the off weeks, we will have interviews with guests, everybody from people like Missing Enigma and Roanoke Gaming, to authors and, uh, you know, other people of that sort. So with all of that said, I'm Aiden Mattis. Thanks for stopping by the Lore Lodge.